Beyond the Mic with Sean Dillon. We're joined on Starline by a critic, editor, and reporter for three decades. She's covered the entertainment industry and is a contributing editor for Vanity Fair. Her latest project is her book, Burn It Down. We welcome Maureen Ryan. Thank you. I was just in Texas last weekend and I miss it already. So thanks for having me on. Well, let's go beyond the mic. Burn It Down has at its base more than 150 interviews from all levels of Hollywood. Why was it important to have so many viewpoints at so many levels? Yeah, I totally understand because part of it is I understand that in every situation there can be many viewpoints. So if an executive at or near the top, if the film is being made on time, and the schedule is being met, I, I'm i not ascribing an evil intent, intent to that executive if that executive is thinking everything is fine, right? So they may not be talking to the people in the wardrobe department or someone in the camera crew or the actors who may be experiencing negativity and, the, you know, or negative situations or, or, or unprofessional situations. So at times you need to have kind of a kaleidoscopic view, if you will, because not everyone has the same point of view. And it's like this in many industries, but I think especially in Hollywood where someone can end someone else's career or attempt to end their career with just a few phone calls or a few rumors being started, there's not a lot of incentive If you are in a production or in an office or a workplace in Hollywood where things are going wrong, there's not a ton of incentives to run that up the flagpole. And I do understand that that's the truth. And I would say most in many arenas of life, there are often not many incentives to report a pattern of destructive or negative behavior because you as the person experiencing it, may end up facing negative consequences that you don't want. So I understand that that's a common thing in life. But, you know, if you are a car mechanic in Tulsa and someone spreads the word in Tulsa that you're a bad car mechanic, you can go um, maybe move to a different city. And you shouldn't have to do that, by the way, if, if people are telling lies about you. But, you know, not everyone in the world will know, will, will believe this false rumor that you're a bad car mechanic. Whereas in Hollywood, you make a number of calls to the right agencies, the right executives, the right teams, the right companies, um, maybe a dozen calls, and you can actually tank someone's ability to earn a paycheck ever again, if not, you know, maybe for years at a time. So the cost of speaking out is really high. I, for a long time, I won't say made a mistake, but I think I... I wish I'd done better at getting a broader range of voices in my work because that said, you know, as a, as a working journalist, you want to talk to the executive who knows the game plan for the company. You want to speak to the the director or the uh, showrunner or executive producer or creator of a show because they know the architecture of the whole thing. You know, if, if I was, you know, if I was writing about architecture, Sure, I would love to talk to the team putting up the steel beams, but they may not know, well, why is the building shaped that way? They're just carrying out the blueprints. I do like talking to people at all levels, but, you know, for a long time in terms of just saving time and learning a lot, I tended, and I think many other people in the media tended to speak more almost exclusively to people in these sort of higher tiers or higher realms. Not that I didn't talk to composers and and costume designers and makeup artists and all that and, 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 you know, actors and of course all sorts of roles. But that was where the tendency of interviews like tended to, the interviews tended to be in that realm. Now I think there's much more awareness of not everyone's having the same experience. Let's cast the net more widely. And that's why for a book, I want people to understand that, I do understand that there are differing viewpoints and I try to offer an array of them. There are times in a chapter where people don't agree about the same thing that happened. And I think that if you want to present something to people, you have to acknowledge at times that these three people saw this situation differently. And that's just the reality. And you as the reader have to kind of make the decision about what you think or where your gut, your gut lands on that. With all the money that Hollywood lost during the pandemic, wouldn't trying to keep its creators 
happy be in the exec's best interest? I completely agree. And by the way, an executive at what became Warner Brothers Discovery gave an interview a year ago, a year and a half ago, where he said that during the first year, the first couple of years of the pandemic, they had had record profits. They actually did okay. Someone put together a, a, a cheat sheet about what the top executives at, say, Netflix, Warner Brothers Discovery, top talent agencies made. A lot of these people were making, in the last five years, made hundreds of millions of dollars. So, yeah, like, workers are really fed up. They're, I don't think they're asking for something excessive or something crazy. You know, they're asking to just make enough money to feed their families. They're asking for now... Hollywood has gone even further toward this kind of gig economy, if you will, which is happening a lot in the world. We understand this, but there has to be a baseline. Otherwise, people can't, like, they they just cannot afford to live in Los Angeles or New York. There's this huge amount of unrest, and I don't think that people at the top necessarily understood how frustrated people are. And I think in some ways it's gotten worse because – The gig economy and the streaming revolution, what that did was make jobs even more tenuous. There's no jobs. There was never much job security. Now there's even less. And people are going from this job that lasts 10 weeks to that job that lasts eight weeks or maybe not working for months at a time. It's just not a sustainable model. And a lot of it was driven by the arrival of these deep pocketed streamers who have billions of dollars and they're making billions of dollars off of us. And the workers are just not seeing the result. And they're also dealing with a system that would take toxicity and say, oh, that's creativity. If you're enjoying these conversations, please check out another Beyond the Mic episode to find more actors, artists, and people you need to know. We'd also appreciate a like and subscribe on the Good Pods app. Maureen Ryan, author of Burn It Down, joins us for The Rocking Eight. Mo, all this is is eight random questions. Answer with the first thing that comes to your mind. There's no pressure. Okay. Marvel owns the silver screen, but DC owned television. Which do you prefer more? Marvel. Should Ted Lasso have a fourth season? Yes. What's the best TV show in the last five years? Oh, wow. Um, oh, my gosh. Now my brain is breaking. Um, That's what the Rocky Nate does. It breaks brains. It, 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 it breaks brains. Succession. What's your first tattoo of? (laughs) The letters BHN, which stands for Be Here Now. Best gift you've ever been given from Hollywood? Someone gave me a mug, which is a form of Japanese pottery, and it's uh, broken pieces of pottery are put together to make a new piece with gold paint joining the, the gaps, and It's beautiful, and it's stronger in the broken places. What was the moment you'll never forget from your trip to Costa Rica? Oh, wow. Seeing a macaw in its nest within a tree. Who is the best character on Farscape? Aaron's son. What's one dream that will never come true in Hollywood? Hmm. Accountability for all. The book is Burn It Down. Author Maureen Ryan joins us beyond the mic for the back half. There is so much online bile thrown at creators, but a majority of the issues come from industry execs and showrunners. How do people get their message if execs don't want to hear it? Uh, I think that's an interesting question because I think, actually, interestingly enough, more than when I was growing up, there's much more of a sense that fans can, that, that fans can influence things. I actually think that, you know, it wasn't a thing to me. You know, I went and saw... Star Wars when it was first the first year that it was out and I I didn't know that you could get more Star Wars I didn't know that was a possibility you know and now you have many many conventions devoted to not just Star Wars but other kinds of things fans are taken really seriously I think on many levels and what they do or don't want can influence things I think where sometimes things fall apart is that fans Fans sometimes don't realize, like, look, if an actor says, I don't want to return for that role because I'm going to go over here and do this part or this project, even if you dangle X amount of money in front of that actor, there are certain things that even a studio can't make happen. You know, they can't. I think they care about what fans think. I think where fans are really most effective is when they create a set of incentives to be listened to. And that does not necessarily mean to be obeyed. 
I don't think that some of my favorite movie experiences were uh, is, is were where I got what I didn't know I wanted. That I think that that kind of serendipity, that kismet, is wonderful. But if fans say we are your street team, we are your marketing team, we will help you get the word out about like if, it, if Chuck got picked up because it became very obvious that fans were going to help get the word out. You know, there was a Veronica Mars movie that continued that interest in that franchise or that property. And so I, you know, we could sit here and speculate, even if the Veronica Mars Kickstarter movie hadn't happened, would there have been this Veronica Mars new season that happened more recently? It's possible because a lot of things are being, you know, picked up from the past and made, you know, additions are made to that story. I think where it's most effective is where they say, Hey, we, we think that this will succeed and here's why. And there's kind of like a positive agitation, if you will. Um, I have seen though the, the dark side of that. And I think the thing that actually drives creative people away from social media or even away from fandom spaces sometimes is a lot of times they don't necessarily have the, those creative people don't have the power that fans think that they have. Because the flip side of, well, we could get that actor to return for the next movie. The flip side of that can be the head of the studio makes you do this in the movie. And if you don't do that as the director, you'll get fired. I actually think that the power that people, some fans think, well, this person could have done X. Sometimes that's possible. They could have, but they made a different choice. And that was their decision, and that was it was their right to make that decision. But sometimes they actually don't have as much power as fans might think. And what I actually did a thread on recently was there have been a number of instances where I've seen very small subsets of certain fandoms, and I'm, I need to emphasize it's small groups of people. It's not everyone. The majority of this, a fandom, as you know, can contain many multitudes, people who loved this entry in the film series, people who didn't like it, but they all get together, they talk, you know, there's like a whole, <laughs> there's a whole, there's a range of sub fandoms within a fandom. And sometimes what happens is small subsets of people decide to go after people associated with a project because they, their perception is that that person had some sway over a decision they didn't like when in fact even if it's the listed director or producer or whoever, they didn't have any sway over that thing or privately, internally, they didn't like it, but they had to go along with it or they would get fired. And what's really damaging is when very low level people who had no sway over something, when they get drawn into or get attacked by, a, a, again, a small subset of people because the Sometimes fans are mad about something. I get it. I get mad about things too. Who you direct that at matters. The majority of people that some, some, these small groups of fans who act in toxic ways, sometimes over a period of years, they are sometimes or actually quite often attacking the wrong targets. They're, and also they're doing it in a way that is counterproductive to their goals. So I think what fans really, and I've seen this happen many times in many positive arenas, what is it that we as this subgroup in the fandom or the fandom as a whole, what is it that we want? How could we get it? I personally don't think that toxicity and years of abuse gets people what they want. I actually think that that can work against it. And by the way, when I say toxicity, Personally, I think a fan can be upset about something, can be feel negatively. I, I had a job where the word critic was in my job title for a long time. I get it if you don't like something. That's fine. Let's talk about it, argue about it, um, debate it. That's fine if, if, if both parties are game. But when you start abusing people, whether or not they did the thing or decided the thing you don't like, when there's abuse and targeting and hate speech, that's where I jump off the train completely. How has careers being canceled changed the way your career in media and contacts are influenced? Well, the weird thing about that word is I don't know who's been canceled. 
I mean, I honestly don't. So this is my translation in, 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 in Maureen Ryan speak of what that means. Someone with access, money, power, connection, and influence, or all of those things, has a temporary reputational setback, but still has access to most or all of those things, and then gets back what they had before after that temporary setback. If... You know, some of the people who've said, sometimes people will say, well, so-and-so got canceled because of, first of all, myself and other reporters, we don't get anyone fired. The actions that those people took becoming public because of certain people that they worked with coming forward, that is what caused a change. And I can't think of any story in which there weren't at least a dozen, if not many dozens of sources that did that. So a bunch of people felt it was important enough to risk their careers and sometimes their their mental health and physical health to bring something to light. And, you know, now the thing is people are saying, well, I, I was, you know, I was canceled or I was denied this or I was denied that. Now people are making a buck off of it. They're doing tours off of it. They're doing podcasts off of it. And I honestly, again, I will tell you, some people that some some have said, oh, I guess that guy was canceled. I'm like, that person is still at that studio making millions of dollars. If that's being canceled, then please sign me up because I would like to get those seven-figure checks. I actually think that there's a nuanced conversation to be had, and the conversation is this. What are the norms and the standards that we as communities or workplaces or companies are going to stand by? And if people are willing to abide by those norms, or significantly work toward those norms, then there are conversations to be had about keeping them around. If someone is unrepentantly hurting, damaging, or financially enacting a vindictive plan on people and not willing to change and not willing to be open to the idea of altering their behavior, I think that's called just consequences. I just, to me, it's just... In my life, I certainly have faced consequences for doing things I shouldn't have done. And that's what we call a society. But that's just me. So will Johnny Depp return to Pirates of the Caribbean? I I don't hand out the contract, so I honestly have no idea. I have no idea. I know that he kept his contract with Dior, one of the leading fashion houses in, in the world, to promote a fragrance. I don't know. It's not up to me. People ask me that a lot about people I write about. Like, what will happen to so-and-so? First of all... I don't write contracts. I don't, you know, I don't offer million dollar contracts. I wish I did. Um, I would give both of us one. It's really up to the communities that they're part of. And the communities that, you know, I'm part of a community here out here in Chicago where I live. I'm part of a community um, in terms of reporters. I'm part of a community in terms of covering Hollywood. So I'm, I'm part of many communities. The communities that these high profile people are part of, they are the ones that determine if that person gets to get those opportunities again. And I think one thing I'd like to interject here, I read the constitution of the United States at no point in that document. Does it say that everyone is entitled to a multi-million dollar Hollywood deal? No one's entitled to anything. Nobody like, that's not how this works. If that, if that was an addendum to the constitution and I didn't see it, please forward that document to me because I'd love to see it. Quote, because I'm an asshole at the cinema, I still have a lot of awkward and I think important questions, unquote. Yeah. So Maureen, what's the one question that still needs to be examined in Hollywood? Oh boy. What do we do about the silent enablers? Because they are as big a problem as the people honestly committing these actions. You know, I wrote at length in my book about Scott Rudin and the media talk about complicity. I didn't write any profiles of Scott Rudin myself. I don't think I ever wrote about him because I was much more of a TV person than film. And he was, he's done a lot in Broadway film and TV, but more film. So Scott Rudin has been in the industry for more than 30 years. And every few years, you would see a profile of like, Scott Rudin has changed. And I'm, you know, I, I, w- I went back into the archives and I read a bunch of these profiles. And I sat there and I thought, based on what? What are you basing that on? Because the, the testimony of the people I spoke to 
many, many reporters spoke to over many years was stunningly the same, stunningly similar. So here is someone who, you know, probably you or I would kill to get this many chances. Like, this is someone who should be out of chances. They have proven over time that they are willing to harm other people significantly, daily. So, you know, you know, when people ask me, like, oh, what will happen to Scott Rood? What will happen to this person? It's up to the enablers. Are you going to keep enabling? Are you going to keep being silent about it and saying, and this is, this is Sean, you'll understand, like you have an Irish name. Like this is what gets my, really gets me going. When someone who has just demonstrated in no way whatsoever, except through words, except through hot air, I'm different. I've changed. Okay, cool. Like that, what, that what, if you accept that without any proof, without any monitoring, Without any, because I do think that in certain instances people can change. As I go into my book, if someone has been that abusive and that full of rage and that harmful to people and and damaging, these are deep-seated things that need to be worked on for years. It's not, well, I went to a spa for a week and I had three massages and two juice cleanses and like, no, that's not that. That's not it at all. So if people embrace those who say they've changed based on their own word, and these people have behaved abusively over a period of years. They have been clinical narcissists who hurt other people in a number of ways over a period of years. If people just say, oh, well, he says he's different, and I accept that now, I really just want those people to understand you are absolutely part of the problem, and that is what I wish I could shine a light on. I wish I could shine a light on every person by name who says, oh, well, we are just letting this person back in because they're different now. There's no proof of that. And the real reason is because they think that they can make money from this person. And just say that. You know, just say it. Just own what you're doing. You have no proof this person's been given many chances at, at, at every single opportunity. That person has not demonstrated any proof of change And again, there are many people who can do the kind of thing this person did and not abuse other people and not be nightmares to work with. So the enablers want to stay in the shadows. And I really wish that there was a way to shine a light on those shadows and say, here's the thing, if you're making the decision to bring back someone who had literally hundreds of chances to change and took none of them or did cosmetic change. And you're believing that that cosmetic change is real based on nothing. Just own that you're doing that by name, go on your, all your socials and say this person who was deeply abusive to others and caused all these problems and kept saying they were going to change then didn't change I believe in them based on nothing. And they've made, by the way, that person has made no amends at all. No, no, like, and I do think that that's one way to think about it. Okay. If you want to be an enabler, do you make your decision? Go to the people that were harmed one by one and say, are you satisfied that that person is different now? And if the enabler talks to all of those people and all of them are like, hell no, Then again, own what you're doing. Don't just slither away into the shadows. Own it. Be part of the change or don't, but just own what you're doing. It's time for One Big Question with author Maureen Ryan. Her book, Burn It Down, it's available now. Maureen, during the pandemic, assistants who were normally overworked watched their take-home pay shrink to sometimes barely $20,000. Would you tell someone's daughter or son who was gung-ho for working in Hollywood to follow their dreams? Or not now? I would. I would tell them to follow their dreams, but I would tell them to be careful, to be wary, to find other people to be their allies and have their back. If you don't have that, you will not make it. Why should people read Burn It Down? Because they love what Hollywood does and they want the workplaces to be better. Maureen, where can people find you online and join your free newsletter? MoRyan.com is my site. There's info there about how to join my newsletter burner account. 
And you can also find me on Twitter at M-O-R-Y-A-N, Mo Ryan. We'll sneak in one more question. What's the one thing you want people to know about Hollywood? I think the one thing that I would like to emphasize to people is that the reason that I know that Hollywood can be better is because I have seen people make it better. The reason that I know that there are good leaders in Hollywood is because I've seen them in action again over time. And so, you know, if, if people are like, well, let's just say that they're all a bunch of degenerates and it can't be fixed. I don't believe that personally. Again, I live in Chicago. Like I'm just paying my bills. Most people who are in the industry are like that. They have, they want a place to live. They want food on the table. They want to be able to pay their bills, maybe go on a vacation once in a while. They're not that different from the people I interact with every day. And what they want is what you and I want, which is I just want to do my work, work hard in an atmosphere in which I am not living in an atmosphere of fear of vindictiveness or of physical or of mental abuse. Like that's not too much to ask. And what's really heartening and what I want folks to know is that it, the change is happening, but I do, I do think that there needs to be much more of it. The big budget billion dollar studios could do more to support it. I think some are, they're trying. I just, I want to keep pushing that change forward because I do think that we as consumers and I'm a consumer of film and TV. I don't think Anybody I've ever met at a con, in a coffee shop, at the grocery store, anywhere, I have never met anyone who consumes entertainment and enjoys entertainment and wants it to be made in an atmosphere in which people were harmed or hurt or abused. Nobody wants that. And we as consumers can just say, you know, I'm not telling people what to watch or not rewatch or go see or whatever, but we have a voice now and they do care what consumers think. So we have a voice as well, and we can just say, yeah, no, we don't want, we, we want to enjoy the entertainment that Hollywood puts out. It can be done in a healthy and productive fashion, which people are not harmed, and that's that's what we as consumers want. Her son's name, Sean, is spelled correctly. She loves photos of her backyard landscaping cats, and she wants you to read Burn It Down. Breen Ryan, thanks for taking the time to talk with us today. Oh, I love it. Thank you, Sean. And that, my friends, is Beyond the Mic.